Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Burns, Executive Director of the Aspen Strategy Group. Welcome to our new digital speaker series. We're delighted that you're with us. Um, obviously, we can't assemble in Aspen, Colorado this summer as we normally do due to the coronavirus, but we are establishing with this broadcast a series of high-level speakers from the United States government and from all over the world to talk about the latest issues of concern to the United States and to countries all over the world. We meet at an extraordinary time of crisis, the crisis of the pandemic, the global economic crisis, the crisis for racial equality in the United States, and obviously a leadership crisis in the United States as well. Today, we're honored to host General Kenneth McKenzie Jr. He's Commander U.S. Central Command in Tampa, Florida. He has one of the most demanding jobs in the United States government. He's in charge of our policy, our military policy in that vast region of the Middle East. Uh, we'll have a conversation today with General McKenzie about a lot of issues, about the continued battle against the Islamic State, about the civil wars in Syria and Yemen and Libya. What should the United States be doing uh, going forward about our military presence in both Iraq and Afghanistan? And here to introduce General McKenzie and to moderate the discussion is my good friend and an Aspen Strategy Group member, uh, David Ignatius. David is um, a celebrated, and rightly so, columnist for the Washington Post. He's been reporting on the Middle East, from the Middle East, for four decades. I don't want to date him, but he has been, and that gives him a lot of wisdom as well as experience. Uh, he knows these issues cold. He's also a protean man. He's written a libretto for an opera that debuted in the Netherlands a couple of years ago. And he's just published his 11th spy novel, The Paladin, which I began last night. And I urge you all to go out and order from Amazon. So David Ignatius will moderate this conversation. And David, thanks very much for being with us. So my thanks to Nick Burns. Uh, I'm happy to welcome General McKenzie. Uh, to our Aspen Strategy Group, uh, Aspen Discussions. I wish we could be under the big tent in Aspen, but uh, we're happy to have General McKenzie here with us. I'm going to ask General McKenzie to take all of us on a tour of his area of operations, a virtual tour. Um, just tell us what he's uh, hearing uh, from all of his commanders uh, throughout this extraordinary area from Afghanistan through Syria and Lebanon. Uh, but I want to start, General McKenzie, by asking you something that is of immediate interest and, and concern to, to all of us, uh, and that is to speak for a moment about uh, the United States military uh, and its uh, sense of professionalism. We all heard uh, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff last week, speak powerfully at a commencement of the National Defense University about the importance of the military staying clear of politics. Your area, CENTCOM, for every president I've covered, has been an especial area of political interest. So speak for a moment, if you would, at the outset of our conversation about making sure that CENTCOM can do its job free of political pressure in this very difficult moment uh, in our country's history. General McKenzie. And David, um, if General McKenzie is delayed, you can just talk about your latest spy novel. There he is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping I, that our audience, our audience would, would rebel. Well, while we're waiting, let me just uh, mention that I had the privilege uh, nearly a year ago of traveling with General McKenzie to the countries that we're going to be talking about, Saudi Arabia, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, all of the areas of this region that, that he commands. Uh, he brought me and David Martin, a veteran CBS News correspondent. And I've traveled with many um, CENTCOM commanders, but this was an unusual opportunity. The crisis with Iran and the Gulf was heating up then to see at very close hand general communicates through me and David and our interviews with him to the public at a sensitive time. Uh, it was really an education in the region and, and in what our combatant commanders have to do. So I'm hoping, General McKenzie, that you're 
now ready and able to join us. Uh, let's just pause for a minute and make sure the technology can work. David, I both see and hear you. How about me? Yes, sir. You just came online. That's fabulous. Uh, I hope our audience can see you as well. Um, and so, uh, John McKenzie, let me ask you to take up the question I, I posed a minute ago. After General Milley's comments uh, last week, what would you say on behalf of CENTCOM about the importance of keeping the military out of politics? Sure. So, uh, David, the tradition of an apolitical military is fundamental to our idea of what a republic should be. And I thought the chairman's uh, comments of last week were, were both eloquent and very clear on, on what that means. And I think he was very courageous in making those comments. And I fully endorse them. And I think he was right on. You know, at U.S. Central Command, it's very easy to be focused on the mission because the mission is large, complex, and it really does eat up almost all our time. But I think, uh, but, but I have taken the trouble and will continue to uh, push the chairman's remarks out to all the men and women in U.S. Central Command, and I fully endorse them, and I think they were needed and spot on, David. And General McKenzie, have you sent your own uh, message to the forces under your command, um, underlining uh, the, the message that's come from uh, the chairman? Sure, we, and we do that primarily verbally. Um, a lot of written messages out there. Sometimes it's easier for them just to see it. So I have the opportunity to talk to my headquarters staff here, which is several thousand people a couple of times a week. So I will typically take the opportunity on Monday mornings and Friday mornings to talk about events of the day. And this is certainly the type of thing we would talk about, as well as to play a song. And it's hotly debated what that song is going to be. So a little bit of humor in that part of that process. But it gives me an opportunity to talk about things like this. So I do that. Additionally, I talk to my commander several times a week. And it gives me, and through that forum, I have the opportunity to also uh, pass on the, the, the wise counsel of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And, and again, I think he was spot on. I think it was good counsel, and I push it, uh, I push it down to my subordinates. Great. Well, I appreciate your starting us off with that kind of baseline. Uh, General McKenzie, let me now t turn to your area of operations, and I'd like to start with the country that's on the top of, of most people's list of concerns, certainly the president's, uh, and I suspect yours as well, and that's Iran. Well, what are you seeing uh, currently in terms of the Iranian uh, threat? Uh, Iran is reported to be suffering in a significant way from COVID-19, also to have real economic problems. Do you see any sign that they're moderating their behavior, moderating their threats toward us or Saudi Arabia? Uh, any, any sign of, of them backing away from the kind of confrontation that was so obvious a year ago. Thanks, David. And uh, first, I just I do need to thank the Aspen Security Forum and, and Nicholas Burns for the invitation to speak here today. I very much think it's important that we have these kinds of discussion. The American people and the international community need to know that we are transparent and uh, we want to share as much information as we can. So this forum is a great opportunity to do it. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to do that. I'm gonna take a little bit of time with that question and unpack it a little bit, because as usual, you sort of seen to the heart of the matter and it really is a relationship with Iran and what that means because it colors other relationships across the theater and what it means to our presence there. So I wanna talk a little bit about tensions with Iran. Um, and so first thing I'd begin by saying is, I would like to dispel the myth that the US military presence in the theater and actions that we've taken in our area of responsibility contribute to the building of tensions with Iran. I think it's a false narrative. We, the United States, don't seek conflict with Iran, and neither does Saudi Arabia, neither does the UAE, UAE, or any of our other partners and allies in the region. We never have. If you examine uh, over a period of time Iranian actions in our U.S. and our international reactions from our partners, you'll come to the conclusion that the United States and our GCC partners in particular, our Gulf, Gulf Cooperation Council partners, the nations in the region, have repeatedly responded to serious Iranian irresponsible and outrageous provocations with a measured and defensive posture that has generally tried to lower tensions. And I'd like to just spend a minute and give you a couple of examples on that because it may be instructive. So going back a year ago, in May of 2019, Iran loaded cruise missiles onto a dial in what was almost certainly intended to be a covert platform to conduct a deniable attack. How we prevented that from happening was we simply did what we would call in our language an ISR soak, platforms overhead that continually look at the ship until Iran abandoned their plans. Why? 
because they don't like it when their plans are exposed to sunlight, when they actually have to be responsible for what they contemplate doing. In this particular case, our measured actions prevented an attack and certainly contributed to a reduction of tensions. Just a little bit later, in May and June of 2019, IRGC commandos attacked commercial tankers in the UAE port of Fujairah and at sea in the Gulf of Oman. The United States assembled an eight-nation international coalition to provide around-the-clock maritime and reconnaissance presence in the vicinity of the Strait of Hormuz. The mission of the International Maritime Security Construct, or IMSC, as we sometimes call it, was to provide continuous presence and expose the source and nature of maritime attacks. Some international partners refused to join that effort and told us that they thought the defensive construct designed to preserve and promote the freedom of navigation and free flow of commerce was escalatory. I think events since then have proven that assertion to be false. The IMSC is not part of our maximum pressure campaign against Iran. So was the IMSC escalatory? I think the emphatic answer is no. In fact, since the IMSC's founding, there have not been any Iranian attacks on maritime shipping in the area, and there haven't even been any serious confrontations with Iranian maritime forces in the area of the Strait of Hormuz. We think this is because our presence makes deniable attacks less likely to succeed, so they've chosen not to try. Again, I come back to my point uh, that the exposure of Iranian activities is a powerful tool, and it's a non-kinetic and a de-escalatory tool, de-escalatory tool that we routinely employ. The clear uh, result of the IMSC has been a result, uh, been a, a drawdown in tension. In June of 2019, when Iran shot down a U.S. drone in international airspace in the vicinity of the Strait of Hormuz, the United States again chose a measured defensive response. Um, the president exhibited tremendous restraint and leadership uh, towards what was clearly an international violation of airspace or uh, intentional violation of international airspace by Iran. We added additional defensive systems to the region and additional reconnaissance assets to closely watch Iran. Again, the United States avoided escalation and met provocation with firm but measured resolve. In September of 2019, Iran conducted a state-on-state -state attack on the oil refineries in Saudi Arabia, the Aramco refineries. Both the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia took a measured defensive approach. We called for an international response to protect the region from future ballistic missile and UAV attacks. We added additional defensive systems into the kingdom, radar, other platforms, as did our international partners. And we advised the Saudis on how to better place and link their own defensive systems to make this kind of attack harder in the future. We continue to work with them to improve their capabilities. While I can't, you can never rule out a potential future Iranian attack, I will point out that there have been no additional attacks since the radar and defensive systems were deployed. Again, U.S. actions made it more difficult for Iran to conduct similar attacks in the future. And we also had the opportunity to advance regional security, and I would argue it also lowered tensions. So in December of 2019, Iranian-backed militias at the direction of Iran conducted repeated dangerous and irresponsible rocket attacks on Iraqi bases that hosted U.S. service members. The U.S. urged the Iraqis to act. We enhanced our defensive posture, and we explicitly warned the Iranians to cease the attacks. Only when a U.S. contractor was killed and we had evidence that Iran was orchestrating these attacks on Iraqi bases and plotting additional attacks, then we, we took action to strike both the Iranian-backed militias and the mastermind of the Iranian-backed attacks. It's also important to note that when Iran's counterstrike killed no U.S. service members at al-Assad or Abil in January 2020, the United States took steps to break the cycle of escalation by not responding to Iran's ballistic missile attack. Ultimately, it was the United States again who decided to de-escalate and maintain a strong defensive posture. In March of 2020, when Iranian-backed militias again attacked an Iraqi base, killing two American and one British service members, the United States responded with carefully scoped defensive strikes against those militias to degrade their ability to attack U.S. and coalition service members. Without a definite link to Iran, we refrained from striking Iran. Beyond the strikes, we added Patriot missiles to Iraq and increased our defensive posture, making it harder to conduct similar attacks. In April of this year, IRGC boats again harassed U.S. ships in the Northern Arabian Gulf, which I would note is away from the IMSC location down in the Strait of Hormuz. The United States responded to the dangerous and provocative behavior with professionalism. We simply chose to expose Iranian behavior to an international audience. Look at the video, it's widely available. You can see the difference between the best Navy in the world 
and a group of amateurs unsure of themselves. We believe that embarrassing exposure of activities like this for the Iranians is unwanted and makes it more likely they'll try to avoid similar, uh, similar activities in the future. So let me sort of begin to wrap up your very good question. If you look at what we've done, I think it's clear that we've repeatedly sought to avoid conflict. We've continued to take actions that reduce tensions. We've repeatedly taken a measured defensive approach. It's what the American people should expect of their professional military. At the same time, if you look at Iranian actions and provocations, you see that the regime in Iran has repeatedly sought escalation in the mistaken belief that, that such behavior will get the United States to leave the region or force us to abandon the economic and diplomatic maximum pressure campaign that has damaged Iran's ability to fund their external hegemonic activities in the region. Iran has attempted to intimidate our regional partners by attacking them in hopes of dissuading them from cooperation with the United States. So in my opinion, the tension narrative, which it's a lot of play in some quarters, is simply a myth. The U.S. military presence in the CENTCOM region is a force promoting security and stability in the face of Iranian aggression. The truth is, what is repeatedly reported as tension is simply Iranian provocations and escalatory, action, escalatory actions that are designed to degrade security and stability in the region. Uh, the final point on this, Iran has profoundly misjudged American resolve. We're not going to quit the region in response to Iranian pressure. I've said this several times before, and I'll note it again here. While Iran may own the early steps of the escalatory ladder because the United States is attempting to avoid conflict, Iran needs to understand that the United States clearly owns the final steps in any escalatory ladder. And I think it's just an important point to, important point to note. So, you know, if tensions decreased, has Iran renounced the escalatory cycle? Uh, I think the jury's out on that, but I think the answer is largely no. First, as you see from the examples I've provided, there have been repeated, uh, repeated stretches, which the Iranians have, for whatever reason, paused attacks and have gone quiet as they plan or contemplate their next provocation. So I don't think the respite that we've had recently is a clear signal that the regime in Iran has reduced or renounced the cycle of escalation. Second, I think the pause in attacks in Iraq, which may have been the result of a confluence of factors, including leadership churn in the IRGC following the death of Soleimani, changes to U.S. force posture in Iraq, the impact of COVID-19 on Iran, and an Iranian desire to lay low in the face of protests by the Iraqi people on Iranian influence during Iraq's search for a new prime minister. So there's a variety of things that may have affected that. Third, I think we're seeing a beginning of a spike in unprovoked rocket attacks on Iraqi bases that host U.S. forces in Iraq. It's my belief that Iran and its proxies are beginning to turn to that because they see they've been unable to prevail in the political realm uh, in Iraq. Uh, the last point I'd just like to hit on is we talked a little bit about COVID, and I would like to I would like to talk about that. So, what is the what is the effect of COVID uh, on on Iran on Iranian uh, on Iranian actions? It has had an effect, but it hasn't stopped their efforts. Um, the triple challenges of sanctions, low oil prices, and the COVID have made it uh, difficult for Iran to raise hard currency and to fund their budget. We've deprived the regime regime of many billions of dollars but the effect on external operations has been tempered by a couple of factors. First of all, prioritization. The regime in Iran has chosen to fund their own privileged elite and their external activities at a higher priority than the services they provide for the Iranian people. Second, the IRGC has developed a robust internal capability to produce a variety of weapons. While some funding for proxies has been curtailed, the weapons continue to flow because they're produced internally, internally in Iran. So while the Iranian medical system was in many ways overwhelmed by the COVID-19 outbreak and medical supplies have run short, the Houthis, for example, have continued to be supplied with the best weapons the Iranians can produce. I think it's also important to note that weapons and the training to use them are the full extent of Iranian exports to their proxies. The Houthis have a significant COVID problem of their own, but the Iranians have not, to my knowledge, provided any medical assistance to their proxy for that fight with the virus. So I think ultimately the contrast between our action and their actions is compelling. Uh, and, and largely, we're out there to advance security and stability. Iran, for their own reasons, intends to uh, take actions to degrade it. David, I'll pause there. There's a long answer, but I thought it was important to sort of set certain established themes that we can come back to. Uh, to you. Thank you. That, that sets the scene. Those are fundamental issues, and uh, that, that's a good baseline for us. If I were just to note two points and ask you to, to underline them, 
if I if I hear you right, you're saying that deterrence has been established with Iran uh, after the death of uh, Qasem Soleimani and other U.S. Uh, actions. Um, but I also hear you saying that the Iranians are stepping up rocket attacks in Iraq. So that leads me to ask you to focus next on Iraq as a theater of confrontation between the U.S. and Iran, and specifically the negotiations that have just begun between us and the Iraqis about the future U.S. military presence in, in Iraq. What are you seeking in those negotiations, and what are we going to do if there are more rocket strikes that put American soldiers and contractors in Iraq at risk? So, uh, David, I think we see, let me start with Iran, then I'll come to Iraq, which, as you know, and I agree, is the principal theater of competition. So, within leader, national leadership in Iran, as much as we can see, there are a couple of competing threads. First of all, I don't believe they want a war with the United States, because they know how that war will end. So that's a, that's a theme that we see there. The second point is they do, as a policy objective, want to eject us from the theater. And they'd like to begin with Iraq going to that end. I think it is further there, but those threads are further complicated by the impact of COVID, which has high penetration in the senior leadership of Iran. And frankly, by the fact that, that Qasem Soleimani is no longer there. The individual who pulled so many threads together for so long, typically the last person to speak, the one who summed up and the one who had a direct relationship with the Supreme Leader. So it's, so they, we, we're seeing con, uh, conflicting, conflicting uh, approaches from Iran as we go forward. I do believe that we are in what I would call a period of contested deterrence as a result of that. I believe that Iran is deterred from uh, large-scale conflict with us, and that is, that is a thing. However, at the same time, they're still wedded to an ejection of us from the theater, Clearly, those are two uh, divergent objectives, and I do not believe they have finally, ultimately reconciled those in their own minds. But let me, let me just turn to Iraq, which is what your question was about, and talk a little bit about that. So I think the strategic dialogue that we began uh, last week at the ministerial level with the, uh, with the government of Iraq is a remarkably good news story. It's going to give us an opportunity to, to go far beyond the security pillar, which is my principal concern, but also to talk about the economic way forward, and a variety of other things that are of mutual interest between our two governments. And that is made possible, actually, by the seating of Prime Minister Kadimi and his government, which I think is going to be committed to, uh, to, to uh, undertake to fulfill their obligations under international law to provide protection for U.S. forces that are there. So I would note, in response to the attacks that have, that have happened, uh, we have seen the Iraqis be very aggressive in attempting to respond against those attacks. And ultimately, that's where we'd like to be. If someone wants to attack U.S. coalition forces inside Iraq, we turn to Iraq first to provide that defense. And I think that this prime minister and his government are committed to doing that. And so I'm very positive about that. Now, we have also undertaken measures to help ourselves. We're in the process of right-sizing our force structure there. You know, it's been large. We're probably going to get smaller. I don't know exactly where it's going to end, but I will tell you this. Whatever force structure we're at is going to be a number that's arrived at in complete coordination and consultation with the government of Iraq. And I do not believe that number is going to be zero. I believe they're going to want us to stay because they see, they see the utility of partnering with us and not only the United States, but also our, our coalition, NATO partners, and other folks that are there to finish the fight against ISIS. Largely finished, still work to be done. And so that's why many uh, Iraqi operations, main force operations, are now undertaken independently. We provide some intelligence support to them. We may provide some fire support for them when necessary, but largely those are their own operations. We also work with them closely in the CT room going forward. So that, you know, so clearly that's what you want. You don't want to maintain a large force presence there. You eventually want to get smaller because we do have other uses for those forces and there are other things we can do with them outside the CENTCOM AOR. So I think Iraq is beginning to take the right steps. I am, again, I'm very, very uh, pleased with where we are in the strategic dialogue. It will pick up, pick back up hopefully next, next month in the United States, if medical conditions, you know, the, 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 the uh, coronavirus condition will allow them to travel. If not, we'll find another way to do it. But that is on track and moving out. And I think it's a very good story. And that is profoundly frustrating to Iran as they look at it. They believe that, you know, they had an opportunity actually to, uh, you know, to get what they wanted, which is ejection of the United States. 
through the political process. So let me cite you just one bit of information that, that came to my attention yesterday. Uh, there's an independent public polling organization that we use, IIACSS, the Independent Institute of Administration and Civil Studies, which is the Iraq equivalent, really, of the Gallup poll. Just finished a polling data. So they found that Iraq's public opinion of Iran fell from 70% approval in 2017 to about 15% approval rating today. In fact, for the first time in a long time, the U.S. had a higher favorability rating than Iran in Iraq. Now, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to tell you it's more than about a third because we're never going to poll very high in, in Iraq. But nonetheless, the fact that uh, among people polled in a very good scientific survey, we actually polled higher than Iran is something that should give us all pause, that we're actually perhaps beginning to accomplish some of our objectives in Iraq that we pursued for a long time and, and we've spilled a lot of blood uh, on that path but we're in a better place than we are now. So David, I'll pause there. So that's, those are fascinating uh, poll numbers. And just to make sure that I and our viewers understand, it's your uh, goal and expectation uh, that as a result of the negotiations going on now, we will maintain some presence. I'm, I'm assuming some few thousands, less than we have now, uh, of, of forces in Iraq that can do the job of training their CT forces, other, other missions, uh, but that you expect that to go forward. Am I right? I, I do, David. You know, so our objective is we want to secure, stable, independent Iraq. And so, you know, that's, that's the goal we share with our Iraqi partners. Yes, I think our numbers are going to get smaller, and we would want them to get smaller. Uh, as the Iraqis become more comfortable at, at executing operations, we can reduce our forces, and we'll do that. I don't know what that number is going to be, uh, but there is no appetite on the part of the Iraqis for a precipitous withdrawal of U.S. forces. They don't want it because they know that we still provide very, very good support for them as they continue operations against ISIS. And ISIS, while... Uh, Substantially defeated, uh, certainly as a, as a ground-holding organization, still has the capability to pose threats in Iraq and in Syria. And there's work that yet needs to be done there. And that's work that we can help them do, not only the United States, but also our NATO and our coalition partners as we go forward. So, sir, let me ask you to turn to uh, Syria and, and, and the, the larger question of, of ISIS. Give us a, a picture of the uh, stability situation in Syria, in particular in the area of northeast uh, Syria, where U.S. Uh, special forces have been working now for uh, years with uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, Kurdish-led, which have faced a, a real onslaught from the north, from, from Turkey. Uh, what's the situation there? How much longer do you see U.S. Uh, forces remaining in northeast Syria, and what the heck's going to happen if they pull out? There's continued uh, fear that Iran might exploit that vacuum. What's the alternative if we end up leaving, that, uh, giving that area up to Iran? Sure. So, uh, David, the situation right now is, as you know, we have a U.S. force presence in eastern Syria, what we call the eastern Syria security area, and it generally runs uh, along the Euphrates River and up to the north. And as you noted, we, it, it, it's northeast Syria and eastern Syria. Additionally, we have, a, we have uh, forces at ATG, what we know as Antop Garrison, which is just north of Jordan inside Syria, right up where the, the Iraqi border abuts the Jordanian border and joins, with, and joins with, with Syria. So right now, what we're committed to doing in, uh, in Syria is working with our SDF partners to continue to pursue the remnants of ISIS that exist up and down the Euphrates River Valley. So in the same time, set the conditions for long-term stability east of the Euphrates River as the, as, as the SDF prepares the local security forces that are ultimately what's going to be needed to prevent the resurgence of ISIS. Because here's, here's the thing. Um, it's easy to defeat. It's easy to go in there and clear them out. What is very hard is ensuring that there's no resurgence. In order to do that, you have to have local and locally accountable security mechanisms that can prevent the rise of, of, of cells and ground holding, ground holding entities. So that's what we seek to do with our SDF partners. Now, how long that's going to uh, go on, David, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, that's ultimately a political issue, not a military issue. I've been given no direction to pull back right now, and I don't know uh, when that would occur under what conditions it would uh, occur. I can tell you that as long as we stay we're going, to, we're going to continue to do the activities that I've just directed. And a key part of those activities, as in Iraq, is, of course, prevention of 
ISIS recurrence that would allow external attacks to be developed against the United States. By that, I mean attacks against our homeland. So there's a very compelling reason to be in there and continue to work with our SDF partners. David, I'll pause there. So uh, just to, to be clear, um, General, the, the question I think people would want to know is whether uh, the ISIS threat, the threat to the homeland, the threat to the region as well, is adequately contained now, whether you have it, what's your comfort level is about that? So, you know, knock on wood, um, today I think we have significant pressure on ISIS. And it's very hard to plan attacks against the United States when you don't know where you're going to sleep that night or you're worried that we're going to come get you uh, through, our, through our SDF partners. So I think strong pressure, strong pressure against ISIS, continued strong pressure against ISIS is the best way to prevent that. And David, I'll just note that, look, the future is never going to be bloodless in this region. Even under the most optimistic of conditions, it's going to be a bloody future. There's still going to be ISIS cells that emerge, actions that are going to need to be taken. Our bar of success, though, is that you want to get to a point where local forces can work these issues without significant assistance from, from us or other international forces. That's our aspirational goal. I never think we're going to get to a point where there's not going to be continued low-level fighting because that's just the nature of where we are right now. But we want to be able to have trained local forces that are going to be accountable to appropriate civilian leadership that can actually keep, their, keep, uh, keep the pressure on ISIS. So, General, let me uh, turn to the eastern edge of your area of operations, Afghanistan, which, uh, as you know better than anybody, is America's longest war at this point. President Trump has said that he would like to be out of Afghanistan, and his emissary, Zalmay Khalilzad, has negotiated an agreement for peace in Afghanistan that calls for significant reductions of U.S. forces. My question is a simple one. Are you going to have enough time before that peace deal is implemented to protect U.S. forces there and have some good chance of maintaining stability uh, in Afghanistan? And what's your uh, current assessment of whether the country is slipping backwards? Reading a lot of the news stories, you, you can't help but think that the Taliban are continuing to push, that the Afghanistan uh, National Army is, is on, on its back foot, and that there's trouble ahead. Sure, David. So there are actually sort of four elements to the agreement of February 2020. The first element is that the Taliban has to agree uh, that they will not allow basing of al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups in, in Afghanistan to operate against us. And by that, we mean principally al-Qaeda and, and ISIS. The second thing is we've agreed that we would withdraw over a stated period of time if those conditions are met. Third thing is inter-Afghan uh, negotiations will begin between the government of Afghanistan and Taliban representatives that would eventually lead to a fourth thing, which would be a ceasefire. So those are sort of the four things that are out there. And what I would tell you now is we have met our part of the agreement. We agreed to go to uh, mid 8,000 range within 135 days. We're at that number now. So we have done that. We have also, I would note that we've agreed by May of 2021 would eventually aspirationally go to zero. We can do that, but we have noted all along that is a conditions-based approach and conditions would have to be met that satisfy us that attacks against our homeland are not going to be generated from Afghanistan. And let me, you know, so that's not the Taliban. What that is, is actually, of course, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. The Taliban have no capability or actual aspiration to attack the United States. But by hosting those two other groups, they would allow those attacks to be generated. Now, they've said they're, you know, they've said to varying degrees that they're going to, they're going to prevent that. The jury is still very much out on that. And, uh, and so I, we will watch the Taliban. I've said before in a, couple of, in a couple of sessions that, look, we don't need to listen to what they say. We need to listen to what they do. And so we're watching what they do right now. And they have not yet completely made that case. There remains an opportunity for them to do it, but time is now beginning to grow short. Now, the other part of the equation is the Taliban have also, uh, also are maintaining a very high, a high level of violence against uh, Afghan military forces. They are scrupulously avoiding attacking coalition and US forces, and they stayed out of the cities. But the level of violence is still too high. That level of violence needs to come down. They need to show that they're gonna be willing partners to reduce it and enter into a negotiation with the government of Afghanistan. 
government of Afghanistan, as you know, has gone through a rocky election process. However, they now have a president and they have a, a negotiator to talk to the Taliban. So I think the government of Afghanistan is poised to begin those intra-Afghan negotiations. That is going to be a key event. That's, you know, days in the future. And that's going to be a hinge moment, I think, in the future of Afghanistan. If they can come to an agreement, if they can complete the prisoner swaps that are underway right now that are part of that, if they can come to a way forward, then we can look at what that future security environment is going to be. Look, clearly, if we have a government of Afghanistan that will complete it, that will carry out its obligations to prevent hosting entities that want to attack the West in the, in, the, in the eastern part of Afghanistan, then we could go very small numbers in Afghanistan. I just don't know what those conditions are going to be right now. And so we're very focused on what the Taliban is doing, uh, how they're participating in these negotiations as we go forward. The jury is still very much out. I'll pause there, David. So just to make sure that, uh, that we're understanding uh, just where you are, because this is a crucial issue, America's longest uh, war, I, I understood you to say that unless you see an additional reduction in violence from the Taliban, consistent with uh, what was envisioned in the peace agreement, and unless you see clearer evidence that they're actually prepared to do something uh, about the continued presence of, of Al Qaeda and ISIS, you your military advice would be that that you're not uh, confident about going forward because the conditions in this con conditions-based agreement have not been met. Am I reading that right, David? Uh that's correct. Of course, military input is only one of the inputs that's going to be considered, and I'll have an opportunity to give that input as we look uh, as we look at the road ahead. Taliban still has time to do the things they need to do. They still have time to make it very clear what their position is going to be on Al Qaeda. Look, we all we know already that there are no friends of ISIS, and will actually work very hard against ISIS and have done so. So I believe they will certainly. Um, for their own reasons, operate against ISIS. What we need to see is what they're gonna do against Al Qaeda. And we need to see that in deeds and not words. And additionally, it's gonna be hard actually to see how you can have intra-Afghan negotiations and reach some way of an agreement forward uh, where attacks are still going at a very high level against the government of Afghanistan. And of course, the sovereign governor of, Af of Afghanistan is gonna have a vote in that and a position on that as well. So I want to just remind our uh, viewers that uh, you're going to be able to ask your own questions of General McKenzie if you would uh, uh, use those uh, uh, with the chat and question functions. Uh, those will be co collated by, by folks at the uh, Aspen uh, Security Forum and then pass to me, and we'll do that in, in another few minutes. Uh, General McKenzie, I want to ask you uh, to stand back a minute and think about your area of operations in the larger context. The United States has struggled with the Middle East now for decades, certainly since I began covering it in 1980, and it's been a series of what President Trump calls, but I think many Americans would agree, a series of endless wars, uh, producing often very little uh, in the way of strategic gains for the United States. And I want to ask you as the, our combatant commander in that region, whether you see going forward an alternative American posture, a way we can pull back somewhat from commitments, but still provide the security and support for our allies. How's that basic effort going? David, I, the national defense strategy, which posits a renewed sense of the threat that, uh, that China and Russia pose, um, I, I was president of the creation of that document. I was the, the director of strategy plans and policy on the joint staff. I was the director of the joint staff when that concept came into being. I was there uh, when it was first introduced and I fully endorse it. We need to uh, be ready to compete against peer competitors on a global scale. And that is gonna require that we look at other at places where we have been focused for a long time and take steps to rebalance. And we've actually done a significant part of that already in US Central Command going forward. So I fully, fully endorse that approach to, uh, to the global nature of uh, the struggle that we're in right now. We've got to be able to do that. So on the other hand, you know, we still pursue a maximum pressure campaign against uh, Iran. And that is a significant uh, U.S. political and economic campaign. And CENTCOM, uh, our part in that is, is, I would argue, would be to deter Iran from acting either 
directly or indirectly, either in the theater against us or our allies and partners in ways to try to throw that program off. And so there is a role for U.S. Central Command uh, as we actually carry that out. Uh, and so we have, to, we have to weigh all that. In every way, we try to find ways to get smaller. We try to, try to find ways to do it more efficiently. We try to use international coalitions when we can. We try to use our partners in the region. The robust uh, foreign military sales program in the region, which have armed many of our partners with very good equipment, where we can, we try very hard to help them make that equipment be as effective as possible. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia and their air defense systems, their Patriot systems, is just one example of that, where they have a number of Patriot batteries, over 20, and we've worked very hard with them to optimize those capabilities. You know, we use, we use the Patriots in a variety of ways. We want the Saudis to be able to use them as effectively as us. And I know that the, uh, that the chief of defense in Saudi Arabia and his team would like to certainly like to pursue that as just one example. So we have to be smarter because we don't, you're right, we don't actually have the luxury of being able to focus on the Middle East as we did in the past. But there are some things in the Middle East that are con going to continue to be issues for us. One of them is freedom of navigation. Two of the three most significant choke points in the world are in the Middle East, the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab, Bab el Mendeb, and of course the Suez Canal. We have a vested interest in freedom of navigation, even though in the specific case of the Strait of Hormuz, we really don't need the oil as much as others do that come through the Strait of Hormuz because we're now largely energy producing rather than energy importing. But nonetheless, as a global principle, freedom of navigation remains very important to us. So those are things we got to try to balance. You know, as usual, uh, you know, I think Mencken said every complex problem is a very clear answer and it's usually wrong. In the case of, uh, in the case of CENTCOM, that's very much the case. It remains a very complex theater and there are no easy answers to it. But look, we recognize we have to be aligned. We have to face the threat that is, that is China. And I'm fully aligned with that. So one more quick question for me, uh, General, and then I'm gonna to turn to our audience uh, questions. Uh, this question is really the flip side of what I was asking before. As, as America tries to uh, step back a bit in the Middle East, uh, right size its forces is a phrase that, uh, that you use. It's just unfortunately a law of life that others uh, step forward. And, and the most significant uh, step forward that we've seen uh, is, is by Russia, which now has a significant military presence in Syria and also is building a pretty significant military presence in Libya on the Mediterranean. I wanna ask you, as you think ahead, whether Russia is going to pose a, a significant threat, or maybe putting it differently, play a significant role in the security of the Middle East in a way that might threaten American interests long run. So let me talk about Russia and China, but I'll, I'll begin with Russia because that's, that's the actual core of your question. Um, I think Russia's presence in the theater is actually fairly narrow. Uh, it's in Syria. Um, and, you know, they're in Syria because it's an old client state of theirs. They held basing there throughout the entire period of the Cold War. They have very, very, very few uh, public international client states. This is one. So it's very important to them. Um, you know, I've said earlier that I, I don't view the Russians as master chess players who have a plan for everything and see, see forward into deep time to know what to do. I think they opportunistically stumbled into this thing in Syria. It gives them an opportunity to try to support a client state, maintain warm water basing in the Mediterranean, which has been a long-term goal of them militarily and, and diplomatically. It allows them to throw sand in our gearbox and try to assert themselves as a player in the Middle East. I'm not certain that's going to work out for them in the long term because I'm not certain that their economy, the base of their economy, which is not particularly uh, large is, and is declining in many ways, is going to support that. You know, we don't see them a lot further east in the region. You know, we don't see them up in the Gulf. We don't see them uh, in other places. And they struggle to maintain deployments even into the Mediterranean and even into, even into Syria. So Syria has been a useful place for them on a very narrow scope and scale to showcase systems and to pronounce their military effectiveness. But I don't think they've shown a larger capability uh, to move beyond that. So, and I will leave Libya alone. It's one of the few places in the world, actually, where I am not directly involved. Uh, so I will, I will leave others to discuss Libya, but I would like to talk about China for just a moment. Please. And so the threat from China, the, the, the issue with China right now is more economic than military. Uh, China seeks to move into the theater and is moving into the theater in a variety of ways through some of the pernicious uh, 
uh, debt uh, traps that they lay out for, for nations to gain uh, basing access. We see it in Djibouti right now. Uh, we see other nations in the region that are talking to them. China wants to do export of military sales. The problem China has, though, is their equipment's just not very good. And, uh, and while there are no end user agreements associated with their equipment, they could care less what you do with it. Still, at the end of the day, it's Chinese equipment. And, uh, and it's not as good as equipment that they could purchase from us or other people as well. China sees the mineral riches in the region. And China is interested in moving in in the long term to, to get after that in Afghanistan and other places. And they've made some attempts before in Afghanistan that were not wholly successful. But going forward, I think the larger, uh, if we were to say great power competition in the theater, the great power competition in the theater in the long term is going to be with China more so than Russia, although I would never completely discount Russia. But I think we, you know, we look at that very hard. And as we, as we redistribute our forces, uh, you know, we want to assure our allies and partners that we're going to be with them, that we're going to continue to, that we're going to continue to, uh, that we're going to continue to support them, even as we change the nature of the relationship in the theater. So, General, that answered the first question that was on my list um, from uh, uh, Tom Roeder, uh, who is a senior military editor of, of the Gazette, uh, who had asked about China and the Belt and Road Initiative, and I think you've spoken to the to the growing Chinese uh, interest and presence in the region. Let me turn to a question from John Negropati, our former ambassador to Iraq, uh, former director of national intelligence, and he asks a simple direct question. How would you assess the current effectiveness of the Iraqi army? So I think it is good enough to fight uh, effectively against ISIS. Um, it's about 250,000 strong, uh, and I think it is good enough to do that task. It may not be a, uh, you know, may, they might approach those tasks differently than what we do, but you know, uh, that's okay. Uh, it doesn't need to be good enough to fight us. It didn't need to be good enough to fight a major Western opponent. It needs to be good enough to fight and finish ISIS, and it needs to be good enough to contribute to the stability and security of, uh, of Iraq. So it, it needs to be able to do those things. And my judgment is making huge strides toward there. That's why we've been able to reduce some of our partnering activities with them. Now, yet at the same time, also we want to be very clear, there's a significant counterterrorism component. That's, when I talk about the main force Iraqi army, I'm holding the CT elements separately, and we still work significantly with them as we go forward. But I think the Iraqi army is, is making strides. It is, uh, it is much better. And, uh, and, you know, not only us, NATO has also invested heavily in institution building with the Iraqi army. The NATO mission uh, Iraq is an element that's going to come in, work principally at the ministerial level to try to continue to build uh, partner capacity with our Iraqi partners. So let me turn to Farah Pandit, who was a leader in America's efforts to message, uh, communicate to, combat uh, Islamic extremism. She asks a, a good question that, to follow up to our discussion about, about ISIS. She says, you speak of making sure there's no threat against the West, meaning that they can't attack us. But what about the ideological attack? ISIS and Al-Qaeda continue to lure ideological recruits. What do we do to balance that dilemma? And so even as they're even, I'll stay with ISIS, although I think really ISIS and Al-Qaeda for the terms of this discussion are, are interchangeable in many ways. Even as the physical space they occupy has become very limited, they have very innovatively tried to reach out in cyber. They've tried to reach out across the globe. And so their ability, you know, when we think of attacks in the United States as an example, we think of three kinds of attacks. Enabled, which is where you actually help, you direct it. Uh, enabled, directed, and inspired. So an inspired attack is what worries me the most. That is where, because of the venom that spews forth uh, in the, through, the, through the cyber channels across the world, uh, people self-radicalize and they are inclined to do lone wolf actions. Hardest of all things to defend upon, defend against in a democracy with the rule of law. Uh, so that does in fact worry me. Look, we try very hard to try to, uh, to, try to find ways to, to, to minimize that. We operate in the cyber domain against them, and that is, and that, but we are not completely there. The other point I would note is uh, in addition to cyber, the other thing that worries me a lot about ISIS in the future is 
in eastern Syria, as you're aware, David, there are a number of in, uh, displaced persons camps, uh, the largest of which in the poster child is probably Al Hall camp. About 60, 70,000 people there, mainly women, mainly children, many under the age of 20. Um, quality of life there is at best acceptable. It's not good, but it is. But it, but we try to. We, we our partners there actually the SDF and other international agencies try to make sure that everybody's got the water and the food that they need. On the other hand, that is a large scale laboratory for radicalization, and that should worry us all uh, going forward because I have seen yet no real effective way to attempt de-radicalization at scale. There are a number of you know what I would call boutique solutions out there that can operate against very very small numbers at great expense and over an extended period of time. But what we need to do is we need to find a way, an alternative to what's happening in that camp. So when I think about ISIS and Al Qaeda, I think about the, the very good question about the international effect, uh, and we're working against that. I also think about what's happening with uh, with our you know with the people that are there now. Obviously, repatriation is the best way to get after that, but you got to get nations that are willing to take them. Additionally there, are foreign, there are, additionally, there are prisons in eastern Syria where about 10,000 foreign fighters are held, including what I would call 2,000 hardcore foreign fighters. We need to get a way to get those people back to their home countries so they can be judicially processed as appropriate. And we have not yet completely solved that problem as well. That's just a very good question. You know, we, we look at the ability to uh, degrade the, what we call the connective tissue between what was once the heartland, the, the caliphate, and the, and, the, and the caliphs overseas. And we're, we're pretty certain that we operate effectively against the movement of human beings, and even some degree against the movement of finance. Where we're still struggling to find our way is how to operate in the cyber domain against those entities. Great question. I, I really wish I had a better answer there. It's not from lack of examination of the problem. I have a question here from Doug Zakheim, who was a senior Pentagon official. Uh, member uh, of our Aspen uh, strategy group, uh, which is sponsoring this security forum. Doug asks, how do you see the impact uh, of an Israeli move to annex parts of the West Bank on our relationships with our Arab allies in the Middle East? Good, pointed, clear question. What do you think? Sure, I think it's going to be, it's going to induce friction into the equation, principally with Jordan. Uh, and I think, yeah, so I think that's just, there's a, there's a very clear answer. I think it's gonna, it is gonna make it harder for those uh, nations to react effect to, to uh, constructively engage with Israel in the days ahead. So uh, Kevin Barron, uh, who's a editor of uh, Defense One uh, asks, there's increasing pressure for rebalanced US foreign policy. You've talked about it that increases non-military tools. What kind of non-military tools would you like to see uh, more of alongside U.S. forces in the CENTCOM AOR to secure your gains and deter others? Where would you invest in those, in those non-military tools in the places we've talked about, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan in particular? Sure, so again, let's take Syria as an example. You know, to get to what actually caused ISIS to emerge, you got to get at the root causes of it, and you're not going to get that through get to that through a military solution. So entities such as USAID, the U.S. Inter Agency for International Development, and other organizations that can actually bring local stability, food assurance, uh, water assurance, all of those things, and actually the you know the, the rights of women uh, are very important as well as we consider that. All of those things are best delivered by non-military entities uh, of the U.S. government. You, you, the U.S. military can be a platform to assist those, but we've got to be, but we've got to be able to, we've got to be able to get at the root causes. I'll tell you the second thing is we've got to be, we, we need to be increasingly active in the information sphere. Uh, you know, Iran is just a, one example, but there are others. Uh, when you have no, absolutely no regard for the truth at any point in your information operations campaign, then you have a huge advantage over, uh, over us who we are always try to be very carefully linked to the truth. So as a result, they can turn and spin conspiracy theories. They can spin stories because there's no accountability and no relationship to the truth. As we work to tell a narrative, we're very careful to be linked to the truth. And, uh, and so that puts us at a disadvantage in time uh, as we try to craft these narratives to make sure we're telling the right thing. Also, it's simply a matter of scale. Iran invests a surprising amount of money into information operations in the theater, and so does China, and so does Russia. 
So we will continue to talk about that going forward, but I think it's clearly an area where we can improve and we can still improve and hold the moral high ground because we need to do that. If we, if I'm not talking about getting away from our relationship with the truth and the need to be centered on what's actually happening, but there are ways that we can be more effective at that move. So we have less uh, than five minutes left. I, I, I'm sorry to say we have two more questions from, from some prominent people I want to make sure I get to. First from Admiral uh, Jonathan Greener, who was Chief of Naval Operations. I'm sure uh, General McKenzie knows well, and he asks a very specific, important question. Please provide your assessment of the stability of Bahrain and its ability to preclude insurgent uh, uh, and other operations uh, that would undermine the government and advance it, the interests of Iran. Sure, so Bahrain is a very important uh, partner for us in the region. The only, what we call uh, the main operating base of U.S. Central Command is at Manama in Bahrain. U.S. Fifth Fleet is headquartered there, and it really is, in many ways, a center of gravity for our operations in the theater. As a result of that, we've had a long, going back many, many, many years, good relationship with the government of Bahrain. I believe that the government of Bahrain is actually well positioned uh, to operate against the Iranian and sponsored and proxy attacks that occasionally occur there. And so I'm very comfortable with where they are on that going forward. We work with them on it, and, uh, and I believe that they're in a pretty good place with that. And it's a matter of significant concern to us. And I also note that, you know, Bahrain was one of the first nations to join the International Maritime Security Construct. His Majesty made that decision. I think it was a, it was a good call for them. So we have, a, we, we have an old and good relationship with them, and I am comfortable about the stability of Bahrain. So, uh, General McKenzie, we have a final question from Vali Nasser, uh, prominent uh, professor and, and the head of studies at uh, Johns Hopkins SAIS, and it's a question that allows you to stand back again and maybe as a last to comment, a look at the region as a whole. Vali asks, uh, how do you assess the impact of the economic crisis across this region caused by COVID, the consequent economic shutdown, the lack of remittances uh, on, on these regimes, which have had problems of stability and, and governance. Uh, Lebanon is a perfect example of the kind of cauldron that, that this period is producing. What would be your thoughts as we leave this uh, conversation about stability going forward in this part of the world? You see any reasons for, for uh, confidence or are we just going to look at continued uh, risk of instability? So I think we still have some hard days ahead of us in the theater. I think the, uh, the global economic crisis, driven in large measure by the coronavirus, uh, has had a significant effect, and it varies from state to state, but it's had a significant effect really on every, on every entity here. Um, and I am, I am concerned about the way forward, but I believe that uh, most concerned actually about how it affects the least transparent state of all, which is Iran, and how it will affect them and their activities, because we know a little bit about everybody else. And, you know, we have, we have good partnerships. For example, we have a pretty good view on what's happening in Lebanon. We know and understand the nature of that crisis. There are things that we would recommend they do, and we are, we are recommending those things. Maybe they'll take our advice, maybe they won't, but there are levers that we can apply to most of the states in the region. Where we have difficulty applying uh, you know, an actual lever is in, is in, a, nation like, uh, in a nation like Iran which has been profoundly hard hit by our sanctions, but also by the coronavirus. They have gone to great lengths to preserve, as I noted earlier, their core military capabilities, even at the cost of their own citizens. And I think that's a dangerous prescription for stability going forward, and one that, you know, that one that may come back to haunt Iran in the days ahead. We'll see how that plays out. But look, I, I would not minimize the uh, pernicious effects of the coronavirus and the economic stressors across the rest of the theater. I think it's a good observation. It varies widely from state to state. Um, and people are having to retrench. People are having to take a look at their investments. Uh, they're looking at the foreign military sales, which is, you know, of interest to us. But I think it will also give them a good opportunity to look at their relationship and the uh, profoundly unfair economic relationship that China tries us to impose on people. So it will be a good opportunity for many countries in the region to take a look at the One Belt, One Road and see exactly what the terms of that relationship with China uh, is and maybe an opportunity to revisit that. So I think that's actually something I'm hopeful about going forward, David. So uh, with that, I want to thank uh, General Frank McKenzie, uh, our CENTCOM commander, for doing just what we promised, taking us on a, 
virtual tour of his area of operations. Uh, General McKenzie is a crucial person uh, in the broad defense uh, strategy and planning of, of the U.S. military. General McKenzie, we thank you for being with the Aspen uh, Security Forum, part of the Aspen Strategy Group. We hope uh, you'll come join us again after you've had a chance maybe to travel in the region and, and get some more information. So thanks to you and thanks to everybody who joined us today for this interesting conversation.